Okay, I'm back with a third way to do the Dirac Landau levels problem. This time we're going to be using the power series method, but in cylindrical coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates like we did in the second approach. This is the last method I currently know of for doing this, so for now this will be the end of the little mini series. If you haven't seen those previous videos, don't worry, I'll get you up to speed, and I'll also provide you with some links to them. In a previous video, link in the description, I showed you how to solve the Dirac equation for relativistic Landau levels using the same raising and lowering operator formulas as with the analogous Schrodinger problem. In a later video, link also in the description, I noted the fact that exactly solvable Dirac problems are rare, as with any partial differential equation, especially in physics, so it's useful to learn as much as you can from each one that you do have. Towards this end, I showed you how to solve the same problem via the power series method in Cartesian coordinates. More recently, I figured out how to do it in the symmetric gauge and cylindrical coordinates. This makes the dirac landau levels problem a great opportunity to get experience working with the Dirac equation in cylindrical coordinates, which is a bit unusual, but elegant and important. It's also quite interesting in this approach to see how different the origin of the factor of 2 under the square root in the final solution is from where it comes from in Cartesian coordinates. Unsurprisingly, we begin with the same Dirac equation as before. I'll take natural units for most of this video, at least until I restore h bar and c at the very end. Now, because no relevant gauge involves a z component in the vector potential, we can split up the dot products like this, where the perpendicular sign means a dot product in the plane perpendicular to the z direction, meaning xy variables, or theta r variables, as we'll be using. It's now that we begin the transition to the symmetric gauge and cylindrical coordinates. And because we've broken it down like this, with these perpendicular plane dot products there, switching to cylindrical coordinates just corresponds to switching to polar coordinates in that perpendicular plane. The most general way to change coordinates is to use the curve to Dirac equation, which I actually do have a video on. However, this requires some more advanced technical skills and isn't really necessary just to change the cylindrical coordinates. In this video, I'll show you a heuristic technique that provides very elegant and immediate result and doesn't require those extra technical skills. It's a modified version of what's often done in the hydrogen atom case. Let's begin by rewriting this two-dimensional dot product. To keep things simple, I'll drop the perpendicular sign in these boxes, but remember that we are still dealing with all two-dimensional dot products, at least within the boxes. The non-obvious but clever heuristic method for transforming to polar coordinates consists of rewriting this particular product of three dot products in two different ways. The first way involves combining the first two factors. Writing them out explicitly gets us this here. Multiplying and rearranging gets us this immediately. Now we can remember that the alpha matrices square to 1 and also anti-commute with themselves, which leaves us with this result here, ultimately, once we do a little simplification. To summarize, we've gotten this formula from the first rewrite. The second way consists of rewriting the second two factors, which written out explicitly are these, if we multiply them out, and then again apply the fact that the alpha matrices square to the identity, and also anti-commute, where we apply the anti-commutativity strategically to get sigma z and lz to show up, we find this result for our second rewrite. We can then get almost all the way to the desired expression for alpha dot p by equating the two rewrites and solving for it. We arrive at this formula. Now there's some value in expressing this in terms of a manifestly Hermitian radial momentum. Specifically, this is the usual one. It's both manifestly Hermitian and has the correct classical limit, which are the two requirements it has to satisfy. More specifically, when we insert the del value of the momentum operator, and we also remember what the divergence is in cylindrical coordinates, we end up finding this value for that momentum. We can then work that in 
in and we find this value for the alpha dot p dot product in terms of a manifestly Hermitian radial momentum operator. It has occurred to me that I committed to h bar and c equal to 1 at the beginning, but I left the h bars in this particular section. It doesn't really matter, but I sort of dream of getting something perfect at some point, and I guess it's not going to be this. Anyway, moving on, we now need to handle the alpha dot a perpendicular dot product. Now just for clarity's sake, I maintained the z component of the vector potential when doing the gauge transformation and the coordinate transformation, but then I drop it afterwards because it has no benefit at that point. Now the gauge transformation from the gauge we use to this one is perhaps pretty obvious, but I mean a lot of times you talk about gauge transformations and students don't ever see one explicitly. It's worth at least seeing one. Here we see that the gradient of this particular scalar factor here does in fact combine with our original vector potential to yield the one that's usually called the symmetric gauge. Transitioning to cylindrical coordinates then causes the symmetric gauge to make a lot of sense because we get a vector potential similarly simple to what we started with except it's simple in cylindrical coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. This is actually all we need to write the Dirac equation via the first of the two methods that you can use for handling this alpha dot a dot product, and it leaves us with this Dirac equation here, which is quite pretty. There's nothing wrong with this expression, but it still does clearly require four distinct alpha matrices to be defined. I was unsatisfied with this because I had transitioned to cylindrical coordinates precisely to reduce the number of matrices needed. It turns out that there is nothing that can be done, at least as far as I know, about this for the following reason. Even if we were somehow able to get rid of the alpha theta matrix, the presence of the sigma z matrix still requires a fourth alpha or beta matrix to be defined given its commutator formula in terms of the alphas. It brings in the one that you don't seem like you need, even if you manage to get rid of alpha theta explicitly. A 4x4 representation is therefore still required. At the time when I first obtained this equation, I hadn't yet realized this reality, and so I still looked for a different way of writing alpha dot a. The rewrite I found actually turned out to be still nice to have, even though it didn't go so far as to eliminate the need for a 4x4 representation to describe the complete problem and I'm going to show it to you just because it is cool. And given its coolness, I did actually end up using that equation instead, even though it didn't provide anywhere near the benefit that I had hoped. Now the rewrite that I found comes from performing the same process that I did on the alpha dot p term. Because the first two factors in this triple product are the same as in that case, we can just skip straight to the answer. Combining the second two terms, of course, yields something different because we're dealing with a not p. Multiplying things out and noticing that the alpha matrices square to 1 gets us to here. We can then use the fact that they anti-commute to get us down to here. At this point, I notice something that perhaps I should have noticed sooner, and that is that because of this minus sign, r dot a is actually just equal to zero, which makes it real simple. We just have this. We can then use the anti-commutativity properties of alphas again to get a sigma z matrix to show up in here. At least if we introduce a factor of i, we can do that anyway. We get this elegant result, which initially made me think I had found a way to get this in a form that was compatible with a 2D representation, but I hadn't yet thought about sigma z very closely. We end up getting this rather pretty equation. Of course, we still do have that problem with sigma z requiring that fourth alpha matrix to be defined as I explained earlier, and that crushed my ambitions. But anyway, it's still pretty. I was still at least happy with that. Moving on. Now we can observe that the particle is free in the z direction and that we're free to force the z component of angular momentum, kind of like what we did with kx in the Cartesian case. This allows us to write this ansatz, and much like with kx in the Cartesian problem, our ability to force mz to be a good quantum number stems from the commutativity of lz with the complete Hamiltonian. That commutativity becomes obvious once we write lz in terms of cylindrical coordinates. We see that given given that theta is the same angle geometrically as phi is in spherical coordinates, it ends up taking the same form as the spherical coordinates expression for LZ, quite intuitively, and it is obvious that this would commute with this Hamiltonian here. Regardless, inserting this ansatz gives us this result for the Dirac equation. 
and seeing that there is no way to leverage cylindrical coordinates to the effect of eliminating the need for a 4x4 representation to describe the entire Dirac equation, I was reduced to using the same trick that I applied in Cartesian coordinates. We separately solve the massless in kz equals zero limits, where we can use a 2x2 two two representation, and then assemble the complete solution by observing that those parameters are completely uncoupled in the original equation. In implementing this trick, I solved the massless case first, so we have this equation. The value of sigma z I worked out in the following way. From the two different ways of writing alpha dot a, we can extract this relationship. Given that we've already used up the first and third Pauli matrices, we must use sigma 2 for alpha theta. If we insert that and our selection for alpha r, we arrive at this equation, which is solved by, well, sigma 3. Inserting that then gets us this radial equation, and this is what we're actually going to start solving. Multiplying out the matrices, applying the dot product, and explicitly introducing spinner components gets us these two equations. Next, this coordinate transformation and this constant definition simplifies the equations down a lot. Previous experience with other versions of this problem led me to try these large r asymptotic forms that got me these equations, and then more past experience plus some experimentation led me to try these small r asymptotic forms. And of course, you only know if your asymptotic forms were valid if the polynomial solutions that you insert end up yielding valid recurrence relations. Anyway, continuing on, substituting to get second order equations finally gets us here. We now are ready to insert power series. That gets us that pretty trivially. We must now be very careful of how we rewrite this. In the first equation, it's pretty clear that all we need to do to factor out the row power factor is to impose this condition and then increment the row j minus 2 terms twice. That gives us this top component here, where rho j is perfectly easy to factor out. However, for the second equation, we must first impose this condition, and then increment the rho j minus 2 factors once, after which we're free to carry out this cancellation here, which leaves us with a j on this rho minus 1 factor. We can therefore increment these rho j minus 1 terms one more time in order to get these, where we have the rho j term factored out of both of them. We therefore have these recurrence relations. As usual, it's straightforward to show in both cases that normalizability requires us to terminate the series, and given those extra conditions that we imposed right here and up here, and the j plus 2 form of the recurrence relations, the termination requirements can be expressed like this. Notice that we have these expressions here for j max in terms of a general integer. That's where the factor of 2 ends up coming from, quite obviously in this case, but it's even cooler in the phi case. Inserting that gets us here initially, and solving for energy leaves us here. Notice how we can bring this factor of 2 in, and, well, we have a factor of 2 up front, but then the 1 that results combines with that one to create another factor of 2, so we can factor it out and get a 4, and so when a factor of 2 disappears all across, we still have the factor of 2 we need, and that way of the factor of 2 coming out, you know, was a little treat as the end of figuring out something of a tricky Dirac equation problem. It meant something to me, anyway. These results are the same as what we found with the other two methods. We can combine these solutions in the same way we did there by inventing this quantum number. We have this result, which should look familiar at least from the Cartesian coordinates video. Next, we can do the other half of the problem. We restore the mass and set kz equal to zero, and I again set c and h bar equal to zero for writing this equation. Again, we're now free to use two-dimensional representation because we only have three matrices. Specifically, if we make this selection, we see that this is actually the same equation that we just worked through the solution of, but with kz replacing mass. We therefore can immediately see what the eigenvalues are. As stated before, the mass and kz being uncoupled in the original equation means that there's only one consistent way to combine these special cases to get the energy eigenvalues of the general equation. Now, it has occurred to me that I ought to be more specific about uncoupled. I forgot to do that in my Cartesian coordinates video. I hope it didn't confuse people too much, but if we look at the original equation, 
them being uncoupled is not just them appearing in separate terms. By uncoupled, I'm also referencing the fact that they multiply different alpha and beta matrices. If they multiplied the same one, their sum would appear under the same square, which is definitely not no coupling. And with that, we're all done. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.